Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. Well, hello everybody and welcome to episode 243 of the Dudes and Beer podcast. I am Chris Jordan, your host, coming to you live tonight from Austin, Texas. So good to be back live with you guys. Welcome to all of our audience up in the WMLD range, the voice of the Hudson Valley. Welcome to all of you folks during your drive time. Uh, So, so glad to be part of your listening pleasure every day Um, and to be bringing you guys bomb stuff like what we have this evening. Our guest, Byron Burkhammer, a therapist from Beginnings Ibogaine Clinic, is here to discuss, as always, being our Dudes and Beer Psychedelia correspondent, uh, here to discuss the world of psychedelia and the recent decriminalization of psychedelia in towns across America. Uh, there are now about three or four towns, I think, and there are another couple going for it, but th- there's at least three or four that have things fully decriminalized now, um, and it's great. It's going to open things up to therapeutic use, uh, research for medicine, all kinds of things. So we're going to be talking to Byron Burkhammer from Beginnings Ibogaine about that tonight. Do not forget that the talk... The Dudes and Beer Podcast, not talking sound. The Dudes and Beer Podcast is now brought to you by PodcastCadet.com. If you're like me and love podcasting or want to be like me and start podcasting, stop on by PodcastCadets.com. That is where you can get all the help you need, whether it is starting your show, naming your show, writing a description, starting your website, learning about distribution, monetization, how to start a podcast for business, schools, churches, whatever. Stop on by podcastcadet.com today. Use the code DUDES20 and save 20% on your checkout. Um, With that being said, we have a great report tonight from John Bown. It came out about a week or so ago about 5G. And of course, we have the great Dr. John Hall. We need to have him on again. Things. What's funny is we got comments last time about how uh, the show about 5G ended up going into politics. And it's so funny to see like most of what we were talking about in that episode is coming to light right now um, in the impeachment trial. It's absolutely amazing. Go back and check that out. But we will be having Dr. John Hall on again soon to talk about some of the things that John Bound talks about in this report about 5g here he is john baum from daily news collective sure 5g means more devices at mega fast speeds low delays and your personal files will instantly pop out of the cloud but the 5g rollout is rife with so many issues threatening human health and civil liberties that it's simply easier for the mockingbird media to sell you a stack of positives rather than address the mountain of negatives self-driving cars smart cities fully connected homes robots this is the future and it will be powered by 5g 5g signals are powerful but they don't reach as far Making it work will require thousands, maybe even millions of mini cell phone towers pretty much everywhere you can imagine. Like every lamppost, the side of every building, maybe even in every room of your home. Self-driving cars, for example, require a continuous stream of data. The quicker that information is delivered to autonomous vehicles, the better and safer they can run. For many analysts, this is just one example of how 5G could become the connective tissue for the Internet of Things, an industry that's set to grow threefold by 2025, linking and controlling not just robots, but also medical devices, industrial equipment and agricultural machinery. Meanwhile, the federal government just signs off on Big Tech's blank check. They will just deal with the repercussions later. Why not? Congress is so unaccountable. Liability is at an all-time joke level. Why not let a massive unknown potential health threat spread itself throughout every city and suburb across the United States? The only way we have a deployable, secure 5G system uh, is either with Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, 
or some combination of them. Um, American telecom companies uh, are playing and will play a central role in the deployment of 5G, both in the United States and globally. But in terms of uh, developing affordable and deployable equipment um, sets, uh, we've got to work closely uh, with um, trusted allies. Coming to a street lamp near you, right? 300,000 of them are going to sprout up in the United States. And preliminary studies from National Toxicology Program looking at 2G and 3G look like it can possibly cause heart tumors and brain tumors in rats, not people, mind you, rats, but change cells in the brain and cause ringing in the ears. So we don't know the long-term health risks, and I'm not willing to take that off the table, especially since 5G is closer to you because it doesn't, it, it's faster and it's higher definition, but it doesn't travel as far. So I need to see longer term studies on this. Why is 5G a risk? 5G is ultra high frequency and intensity, which is further compounded by the millimeter waves that don't travel through objects or as far as 4G or 3G. Add to that, more mini cell towers must be installed because the current cell towers can't accommodate 5G. As RadiationHealthRisks.com writes, it is estimated that they will need a mini cell tower every two to eight houses. This will greatly increase our RF radiation exposure. All cell towers emit radio frequency radiation. This is what makes them dangerous. 5G can support up to a million devices per square kilometer, while 4G supports only up to 100,000 devices per square kilometer. With RF radiation, how close the source is to our physical bodies is more important than the power level or wattage of the radiation. RF radiation dissipates with distance. In other words, a low-powered exposure right next to someone is more dangerous than a more powerful exposure a long ways away. Also, the longer the exposure time is, the more dangerous it is. 5G will be the worst of both worlds. We will have more sources around us and closer to us, and there will be more powerful and continuous emissions. One solution? You can invest in a Wi-Fi router guard. A Wi-Fi router guard will block between 90 and 95% of the RF radiation that your router emits. John Bound reporting. John Bound there. Coming in with some great stuff. Make sure to check him out at Daily News Collective. So happy to have him part of the HC Universal Network. Uh... Thank you for everything that you do, John Bound, not only for the network, but for knowledge, truth, getting things like that out there. Um, once again, everybody, our topic this evening uh, with our guest Byron Burkhammer will be the decriminalization of hallucinogens across America. What that means, what that might mean. Uh, I do have one more audio clip. For you guys before we welcome our guest and I think it's I, I think it's really apropos to play this uh, because uh, Timothy Leary is probably considered the the guru of LSD not the father of LSD but the guru of LSD most definitely um, and it's interesting to hear from his words what it's about he was one of the people that said we should just decriminalize all drugs and make people go out and get a license like a driver's license you know like you got to go out and take a psychological test if you want to use cocaine are you a addictive personality type person if so you can't be licensed to get it um so interesting concepts but let's hear from timothy leary himself turn on tune in and drop out drop out of college Drop out of graduate school. Drop out of uh, junior executive. Drop out of senior executive. Turn on. Tune in. Drop out. <laughs> the importance of that to me is that it was a, a demonstration of the, part of the baby boom generation of their numbers, of their strength of their clout, of their power, which is just great quantity numbers. There were 76 million Americans born between the years 46 and 64. They were trained by Dr. Spock to be demand fed. They were the first consumer species. They were the first electronic species. But the very fact that you were an American and young meant that you uh, deserved the world. And I don't apologize for being kind of goofy. 
Because at the same time, we had Johnson uh, running the country, uh, spending 500,000 troops to uh, Vietnam. We stopped that. We had Chad Gere Hoover, a uh, total madman, uh, running our secret police. Uh, so uh, we did great. But I don't want to be held responsible for, for the day-to-day -day quotes because literally we were out there in the front lines uh, just making it up as we went along. And uh, I give us this credit. We were willing to take risks. We were willing to be holy fools. We were willing to make asses of ourselves. But let's not. <laughs> Let's not hang these uh, portraits of ourselves, make a fool of ourselves on the walls of the Smithsonian Institute. And I think I think it's nice to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, folks. Because uh, welcome to the show, by the way, Byron Burkhammer. How are you doing, my friend? You still there, Byron? Yes, I am. Great, great. Sorry about that. Uh, how have you been? I've been doing well, Chris. I've been doing really well. Great, man. It's been way too long since we've had you on, and since then, I mean, whenever we first had you on the last time talking about the bufatode poisonings uh, going yeah, on with animals yeah. and people in Florida uh, was yeah. right at the time that Colorado and Denver uh, mm -hmm. passed the decriminalization of mushrooms. Yeah, and yeah. shortly after Oakland. Yeah, and and it was it was wild because Oakland went like ayahuasca. They went all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, they sure did. They and really did. it's it's really interesting. Like I said, to hear Timothy Leary talking about that um, because yeah. you know uh, you you have a career and it gets boiled down to a quote, folks. Um, he was he was a great psychologist before that had a had a long long standing career in research um ran across yeah. LSD through research and was part of the the hipster underground things like that um yeah. and went off um and some would say off the deep end uh he would say well, off the enlightened end some would say off the deep end and uh Terrence McKenna or Dennis McKenna would uh differ beg to differ yeah, they would uh, just say he was the uh, father of their work, so to speak. And uh, you know, Terrence has passed away, of course, but uh, Dennis is still going strong. He still uh, attends uh, laughs in in oh. California every year. That's the um, Los Angeles um, Science Symposium for Psychedelics, and uh, he still attends that every year. And, and he's he's a big proponent. So we, we, we've got people moving forward, building on Timothy's work. Well, and and that's just it. Like I said, to to hear him say, yeah, you know, we went out and we made asses of ourselves publicly to get this message out yeah. there, to sure. let people know uh -huh. about this. And, you uh -huh. know, like... I've, I was telling you before the show that I've I've had the struggle of whether or not to rename the show before, um, because dudes right. and beer can be a little bit off putting to some of our guests who we have had sure. on. Like initially, whenever I contact them, they're like, "Yeah, this typically isn't the kind of show I do," and I'm like, "Please, right. please, please visit the website." Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I know that the name sounds a certain way, but. Here's the concept, and I lay out the idea like I did last week uh, for but our you listeners. Have substance. You have substance to your show. Well, uh, that's, that's just it. Important. Is that it's a it's a what's in a name, as as right, Shakespeare right. would say. You know, right. um, exactly. the The name just gets the conversation rolling. It's the mm -hmm. fact of uh, beer, what have you. It's the great leveler. Um, yeah. the public house was the great leveling ground where everybody went, drank on equal ground at the bar. Um, that's right. where the revolution was plotted. That's where scientific mm -hmm. conversations happened and philosophic conversations and the like. So, um, if we go back to that, I think we might be better. Uh, if we could, well, if we could have these conversations and decriminalization of hallucinogens, I think is a big conversation. It's, it's a big one. It is a big conversation. It's a very big conversation. Uh, for most people, you know, um, any, any of us that, that, that delve into the field of psychedelia, we're considered kind of out there by most people. Um, my friends consider me that way, just out there. Byron's out there. But I don't see it that way. 
I see this as a very progressive thing. I see this as a very scientific thing. I see this as the coming thing. I see this as the coming thing in, uh, in well, you know, psychological medicine. We're going to have a lot of, uh, in the future, I see, what I see coming is in the future is uh, MDMA-assisted therapy. Uh, I see uh, a lot of microdosing coming into play. Uh, and as far as people's mental health, you know, and getting people better, and that's what we need more of in this nation, is a, a mental health um, kind of a, a I guess you'd say an, a, an infrastructure needs to be kind of uh, redone in the mental health industry, if you would. And uh, I see these things uh, coming into play as a big, big, big help. Uh, they really will be. And there's no doubt. There's no doubt. These medicines are here. They're here to stay, and they're here to go forward, you know, and, and uh, keeping up with the mental health. Um, people are already using uh, psychedelic uh, such as psilocybin, treating depression, microdosing that, um, and, and getting great help from it. Uh, people, the, the, the work I do with Ibogaine um, has freed people from uh, years of PTSD and depression. I've seen people that cry the next day after they've gone through a, you know, a session of uh, Ibogaine. Yeah, and you know it's just like they're a new person, and and there are tears in their eyes because they they say they're over. Yeah, it's over if you want it to be, you know. And we have to carry this work forward, so we have to do this. Well, um, and I I think it's I I I firmly agree with you myself. Uh, yeah. I think that these substances, these compounds, hold great great possibilities. For healing, yes, specifically did. things like ibogaine, ayahuasca, DMT. Um, yeah. I mean, all of them, all of them. Uh, and Maria Sabina even even mm. said it. She was the she was the Oaxacan uh, mushroom priestess uh, that really brought the the knowledge of mushrooms to light in America. And I want to say it was right. like a Rolling Stone right. article or something like that. Um, and I know who she was. Yeah. That that mm -hmm. in the book uh, that came mm -hmm. out, right. and that really got people going down to Oaxaca, things like that, uh, doing the ceremonies and stuff. But she even said that the Westerners don't treat the mushroom properly, um, and that's true. They that's and true. you know that's that's the thing. That's that's and even whenever you start to have the conversation about it with most people. That's immediately where it goes. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's like, well, if that's where your mind's stuck, sure. Absolutely. You know? Right. Uh, right. But there, there are a thousand and one ways and cultures like Maria Sabina's, um, the, the Native American cultures, uh, cultures in Africa that used Ibogaine. Uh, South America that used ayahuasca, things like that. They didn't just go out and make some ayahuasca and like chill out on a Sunday afternoon and just ayahuasca it up while they were fishing. That's not what they right, did, right. people. They didn't like carry around a Sonoran toad in their back pocket and just go around taking it off it and licking it. Uh, you know, it was done for sacred reasons. It was done mainly for healing reasons. And, and and the thing the thing about it when you use the word revered, uh, these medicines were revered. Yeah, they have been revered for thousands of years, and they're revered because they're healing. They're called master plants for a reason. Um, the master plants are used to heal, and and this is what the shamans have always known. They've gone into this knowing that that these are revered medicines. They're to be respected. When you go in to use them, you're to, to use them a certain way. You're to use them uh, ceremonially. You're not to use them, you know, in a, you know, they'd never In a be, recreational uh, way. Never, never. They would, these, these medicines would never be used recreationally. I don't, I don't think I know of anyone that would, 
pick these things up and use them recreationally. They're just not used that way. Yeah. Never have been. Even even and, when um, lysergic acid was first mm-hmm. synthesized, it right. was not intended to be used in that way. Right. I mean, the doctor dosed himself to see what would happen in the light. Sure. Um, and, that, but and that's a scientific method. It was meant to be used in a clinical atmosphere. It was meant to be used to help people have psychological breakthroughs, to help them have spiritual breakthroughs in psychology. Right. Uh, to like you're saying, to help heal them. There's a, right. and somewhere we lost our way. Um, right. Well, I think I think what happened in the '60s when we had the um, the the counterculture or whatever you want to call it in the '60s, um, a lot of things just kind of flew under the the blanket, if you will, and and, and there was kind of a blanket ban on everything. You know, uh, you had some illicit drugs, but then you also had some, you know, the psychedelia was involved in it. Yeah. So you had this blanket ban on all psychedelics. And that just kind of um, stopped everything right there uh, for many years, 30, 40, 50 years now. Yeah. But now we're finally getting to the point where we're beginning to see, okay, we made a mistake. Uh, there were some things that were banned that shouldn't have been banned because now we're seeing the, um, well, the, the scientific benefit, you know, the, the psychological benefit. Um, people are using MDMA assisted therapy and, and that's gone into clinical trials. And even, uh, the psilocybin has gone into clinical trials for depression, well, microdosing that. And what's so funny is to come out of it. And MD- that's a good thing. MDMA. That's a very good thing. MDMA and decriminalization has been a great thing to help that yeah. along um, because it's just going to influence the way the legal system works further. Um, you know, when you say decriminalization, say in Portugal, for instance, Portugal, all drugs are decriminalized. Yep. Uh, I have a very good friend that has an Ibogaine clinic in Portugal, and and we we speak frequently. And uh, all the drugs are decriminalized there to the point where if, you know, say you go up to somebody that's uh, shooting heroin up in a park, you don't arrest them. You go up and you, you offer them help. You know, do you think you're, you're being helped with your use of heroin or whatever? It's not a, it's not a criminal matter anymore. Yeah. And that's what needs to happen in this country. You know, all the drugs need to be decriminalized. We have far too many people in penitentiaries serving way too much time for things that, you know, are just oh, yeah. frankly ridiculous. So we need to go to a, a model like Portugal. We need to decriminalize. And when we get into that mindset, we can then go forward and, and advance the science of this. The science of microdosing ayahuasca, ibogaine, psilocybin, all of these things. Well, and That's just my opinion, I, but uh, I do believe you know that that's the way a lot of the people that work with these substances are are, are trying to get. Them. And there's a lot of us that are proponents for decriminalization across the country. Well, and what. Where I think people get lost, Byron, and I've tried to explain to this to people uh, whenever it comes to decriminalization of marijuana, uh-huh. um, even legalization of marijuana, is you, right. you you can't just go to the park and open a six-pack. Right. But beer's right. legal. All right. right? Uh, same thing. You're not supposed to get just, like, go to the park and roll up a J. And right. light it up. Right. That's not how you that's supposed to, do... to work. It's supposed to be in your home, folks. Right. Or it, in it, a properly it, it, designated location. Right. And and that's the whole thing, you know, when 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 people can see that these things can be used uh responsibly. Man. They can be used in a clinic or they can be used in a in a home setting or a place of healing. Uh we have many churches now. They're called churches, but they're churches for ayahuasca. They hold ayahuasca sacraments. 
There's even churches for Abogain, um, more in South America, but they're coming into the North America. But mainly, you know, in North America right now, there's churches for Ayahuasca Sacrament. These things are used responsibly. They're used with a trained professional that's dealt with them for, for years. And uh, they're, they're going to help you, you know, when you ingest the substance, they're going to help you through your journey with it. And they're going to help you through to your healing. It's not about an illicit drug. It's yeah. not a drug. It's an entheogen. And, and that, that is the proper term, entheogen. Uh, that's what these substances are um, because they're healing substances. And, the, and, the, and that's the way you use them. And, and, and that's what I think the big uh, people that are pushing for decriminalization, they're very involved in the healing community. Um, in the community that wants to promote um, these substances being used in psychological medicine, um, you know, healing and that sort of thing. You know, it's it's about nothing else, really. So I I think it's a great thing, you know, and and, and marijuana as well. Um, Marijuana is a very, it's been vilified. Oh, yeah. it's, It's been vilified for 60, 70 years now. You know, and that, and that was just propaganda. Oh, um, and and you know, shown and, to be such. Uh, yeah, of even and, and, and even Dinesh D'Souza, or not Dinesh D'Souza. I'm sorry. Um, I, I was reading an article by him earlier, um, but oh, he's a great, uh, great guy. Uh, but um, I'm trying to remember who it was. He was he was the head of the World Health Organization a few years ago. Uh, came out and said that. Uh, I've been shown studies now that I've never had access to. Why has nobody shown me right. this? Marijuana absolutely right. has medical benefits. Right. Um, why, and, why, do, why do people not understand there's a, a cannabinoid system in the human body? Yeah, and it, I mean, was, it, was the, it was the classification of marijuana and other psychoactive, psychoactive substances uh, by, right. by the DEA whenever they were created. Uh, mm-hmm. as Schedule 1, which meant that they had no therapeutic use. They had right. no medicinal use whatsoever. Uh, they right. weren't even good for research. And that's the thing, is that you can't even do research on these things. Like MDMA uh, was actively used originally by relationship therapists in, in guided right. sessions. Between right. husband and wife, where they would, because MDMA folks, just so you know, uh, street name ecstasy. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so it's, it, it, you know, that was, it was originally used in therapy sessions to bring you know, couples closer together to drop the barriers of communication. And, and, and it's very effective. It's very sure. effective. And, and people now are. Our, our people now are seeking, you know, underground yeah. ways to access these therapies. That's just and it. Really, it gets dangerous, right. right? And and you know, if we could make this safer, you know, it's about harm reduction. That's another thing. That's that's the term I love is harm reduction. Hmm. When you go into uh, these things with a harm reduction mindset, you're going into these kinds of therapies, saying that. Okay, if we make these therapies available to trained people, trained psychologists, trained psychiatrists, can we make this available to them for them to use for therapy? They can do it safely. You know, and without decriminalization, we're not going to have that. That's the beginning. Decriminalization is the beginning of that argument and that discussion and that, you know, thing moving forward to bring these things into uh, therapeutic settings. And and frankly, that's where we need them. You know, they're beginning to do these these studies on mushrooms, psilocybin, and, and depression. But, you know, we, we have a whole lot of other, you know, substances out there to work with. And what would be interesting, Byron, would actively be a study with these indigenous uh, with the indigenous cultures that use them, uh-huh. 
possibly yeah. even showing the difference in uh, the the rate of depression, rate of uh, psychosis, things like that, that happen well, within these cultures, and whether or not these cultures have had ready access to society as well being included well, you know, in that. Because, you know, very- you, d- you don't like... There's there's an average, folks. You know, there's there's like a number, like one out of every like ten people is going to have some type of depression. You know, things like that. But is that the case in the Amazon with the people that have been using ayahuasca? You know, it's interesting that you say that, Chris, because um, I don't know what the the percentages are or the uh, the the rates of um, you know illnesses are, but I would say that. In the um, in the past, cultures that have used the ayahuasca, cultures that have used the ibogaine, even cultures that have used DMT, have far less likelihood of um, people, you know, with with psychological long term psychological illnesses. They usually go for healing. The shamans uh, work with the people. They work with the substances. And they somehow bring about a homeostasis, you know, in a person's mental health. And that's what's been thought for thousands of years. And that's what's been had for thousands of years in these cultures that have used these substances. And that's just, um, well, that's just scientific fact. You know, as, as far as what, you know, the percentages uh, as contrasted to our state today, I don't know. But I would say we're far less healthier than we were in those times using those substances with those shamans. Yeah, absolutely. And the the key here, folks, is research. Uh, right. That's that is the door that's opening with the decriminalization. We aren't talking about like just being able to stroll down the street with your eighth of mushrooms. You know, right. of course, that means right. that you won't go go get a just because you're trying to expand yourself a little or relax on a Saturday night uh, doesn't doesn't mean that you're going to end up with a prison record, you know, right? Um, or didn't. or with a police record of some sort or a right. felony charge because you've got to eat the mushrooms, um, All right? And and that's nice too. We're also unburdening the legal system, which is right. fantastic in most major cities. Uh, the other big thing, though, is that this is opening the floodgates for research it is allowing studies to be able to actively go on in these states while these things maintain a schedule one status with the dea which hopefully these unabashed studies and things like that will help bring about a change in in those Uh, Because even most studies that were done properly with marijuana were poo-pooed long ago um, and will never be looked at, ever. Right. Because of that, um, it's it's just, it's it's tainted. Um, It's it's fruit of a tainted tree right now, and you're just, you're not going to do it. Um, And we're going to have to take these things out of the Schedule 1 format, if you will. Uh, Schedule 1 meaning there's no medical use or, you know, no news for this substance, which is, is just not the case. That, that's just not true. That's uh, I've got a complete misnomer there. Um, but once we take these things out of Schedule 1 and we, uh, we make them available to scientists, people that want to do the studies, you know, like we're doing with psilocybin. I don't know exactly how that's working out as far as how they're uh, descheduling or rescheduling. I'm not sure how that's working out as far as, you know, how they're making it available to the people that are doing the research. And I really haven't seen any studies yet. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure it's the fact that they can grow it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, they, they can do this with the, uh, the other substances, but, um, once we decriminalize, that's that's the first step. That's it right there in a nutshell. Once it's decriminalized and we get this going across the land, uh, you know, we've got it going on in Oakland, 
um, in, in Colorado, you know, but, but we need to make it wider. You know, it needs to be a wider thing. It needs to become federal that it's decriminalized. And uh, hopefully that will be the case in the next five years. I actually do see that coming in the next five years. Well, the it, next five years, I it, do see it. It's very interesting because our our drug war, um, mm-hmm. and and we've talked about this with Raul Diego from Deep City Chronicles before. Uh, he's busy working on his documentary Ghost on the Water right now, uh, right. but we had him on to talk about his miniseries documentary that he did uh the un- huh? the unhinged truth of the drug war and about the failure that the drug war is <laughs> oh oh yeah but not just that about the fact that most countries where drugs are illegal and stuff like that it's because they want to do business with us it's because we yeah. say oh, yeah. you you want to do business with us you will enforce this law in your land right um and that's crazy sauce that's crazy, it, um, it, but it it's is. true. And, and, it's absolute and we truth. Have a, we have a big deep state problem here, but that's a different subject. Oh yeah, that's a that's a conversation. <laughs> I would. I've got guests for that, buddy. Believe me. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Sir. I'm sure I'm, you do. I'm not connected to QAnon, but uh, there may be an on in there. Um. <laughs> well, there's there's a serious problem with. The deep state and drugs are a big problem. Well, here. it's it's the just CIA the fact the of brought, yeah, yeah. The CIA are the ones that brought cocaine uh, and and flooded college campuses with it. Yep. You know, and, and as a consequence uh, from these things that they brought in to flood college campuses with, all these other wonderful substances fell under a blanket ban of criminalization, and that was wrong. And now we're beginning to see that wrong. Thank goodness. Well, and and let's not also forget the marriage of Big Pharma into that, uh, which, oddly enough, much like our guest last week where we were talking about the decorporatization of America and and getting Uh rid of all that. uh, Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny how, you know, you, you invite the drug companies in to help write the laws that regulate the drug companies. You bring in the health care system. To help write right. the law that regulates the healthcare system, I, 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 uh-huh. that's that's funky to me. Um, I was well, never it, I was it, never it, brought into HR to like, hey, let's write your rules real quick. Um, well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's 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 the fox guarding the hen house. Oh yeah, it's most definitely, and it's 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 the the dirtiest money washes the most hands. Um, right, that's right. that's all there is to it, uh, and and to see the fact that. Yes, there were active interests in people like DuPont, uh, in in major companies like Johnson and Johnson, uh, big pharma the companies, Sacklers stuff and like that. It's better yeah. than heroin. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it is better. Than yeah, heroin. yeah, exactly <laughs> how it was advertised. This is better right. than morphine. Right. So, exactly. so I'm going to give it to someone for a daily maintenance then, because it's better than morphine. You know, because right. that's what any doctor in his sane mind is going to give somebody for a daily maintenance is some morphine. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and But that's exactly what happened. And, you know, the, the thing is, is if we'd had these other things come into play, uh, these other substances like, like um, psilocybin, ayahuasca, ibogaine, we might have had, well, ibogaine can correct uh, an opioid uh, dependency in, in as little as eight hours. That's how incredible this medicine is. Nothing else on earth can do that. Well, Nothing on earth can do that. And you, you but, know, Byron, real quick, uh, because we, we do have uh, one hour with our audience uh, in, in the Hudson Valley on w, uh, uh-huh. WMLD. I don't want uh-huh. them to not hear about what y'all do. At beginnings okay. I began. So let's okay. go ahead and get into just a minute. Uh, what uh, it, for about the next fifteen minutes or so before we roll on a little bit deeper into this? What is I began, and what do you guys do okay. at Beginnings I began okay. Clinic? Sure. What we what we do is we take a person that is uh, opioid tolerant, and and that is a person that is addicted to heroin. 
uh, Oxycontin, fentanyl, which is being cut into the heroin now. You can very rarely get pure heroin now anymore. It's usually cut with uh, fentanyl coming from Chinese laboratories. So that's the real opiate crisis in this country is it's fentanyl. Absolutely. From Chinese labs. That's what and cost so, us all our stars. Right, right. And, and, and people are just dying right and left. They can't even get the needle out of their arm before they're dead. But what we do is we take a person that's very opiate dependent, opioid dependent, um, and we treat them with a substance called Ibogaine. And the way that works is we we bring them into a clinic. Um, we do uh, some testing. We do um, testing on the heart to see if the heart is um, you know sufficient to be um, a candidate for treatment. We also do treatment uh, or testing on the liver to see if the liver enzymes are, you know, if your liver is able to metabolize the abogaine and the other substances we're going to throw at you. And uh, we basically do a treatment where we hook you up to a heart monitor. You're on the heart monitor. You're just kind of laying there in bed for about eight hours. And we give you... um, this is a viva game. And we give that incrementally. So we kind of ease you into the trip because it is a psychedelic. It does cause a psychedelic trip. Um, but at the end of that eight hour trip, which is about eight to 10 hours, you are going to have your brain chemistry reset. The receptors in your brain will be healed. Um, receptors that, you know, you've exposed to uh, narcotics for, you know, years are going to be suddenly healed because iboga expresses a nerve growth factor in the actual plant, in the medicine itself that heals these receptors. And so you come out of this and most people go through a withdrawal process, you know, when they quit using opiates. If you suddenly stop using opiates, you're going to go into a withdrawal process. Oh, yeah. That can last for, you know, a couple of weeks, up to a couple of years. And can be physically, physically taxing as well. Physically sick. You're going to be physically sick. Um, You're going to be physically sick. And, I mean, it's like people that have gone through this would never want to go through this if they didn't have to. Um, But with Ibogaine, we can shut all of this off. We can turn all of the withdrawal symptoms off in about eight hours. So when the person comes out of the trip, they're pretty much done with the opiate. There's no cravings for them. Uh, The withdrawal symptoms are gone. You know, everything's just back to the way it was before you started using the medication or before you started using the heroin or fentanyl or whatever it is that you were using. And that's how Ibogaine works. And and there's no other substance on earth like it. There's nothing else that can do this. So it's kind of a wonder medicine, but it's a medicine that's been used by the Bahwiti tribe in Africa for thousands of years. They've used it as a rite of passage. Um, but you know, we just kind of found out by accident that it it works with opiate, uh, opiate withdrawal, opioid withdrawal. So that that was kind of found out by accident by a guy that was a heroin addict himself. And uh, he used it, you know, a friend suggested he used it uh, when he ran out of his heroin. When he used it that, that time, he uh, used it and had a, a psych- psychedelic trip. At the end of the trip, he realized he didn't need the heroin anymore. So that's how we got it. But it's, it's, it's a great medicine, and, and we're using it to this day uh, out of the country in Mexico. Um, Baja, Mexico is where we're using our – that's where we have our clinic, beginning to begin. And just since having you on, um, I've, I've, I've told you before, I would myself still love to come down and go through a treatment. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. just to be able to better explain it to my audience. Um, cause I can, I can, you know, I, I can talk about my psychedelia experiences, my experiences on LSD, sure. uh, mushrooms, things like that. I have yet to 
um, try ayahuasca, and I've been trying to find you. And that's actually how we met was in an ayahuasca chat group. Yeah, um, yeah, it sure was. But <laughs> with, with me looking for an that? ayahuasca to come on the show, and you were like, "Well, this is what I do." And then I started doing some research, not just into you guys, but into the topic of ibogaine. And I was like, right. "Wow, this is incredible. This is great." Um, and to to know that compounds like ibogaine and iboga mm-hmm. are on the list of things like they they haven't fully hit yet. I don't think ibogaine hit the list in uh, in Oakland. Uh, Oakland, I, I think, was by far as of right now the most comprehensive decriminalization yeah. out of everybody. And, and it was almost included. It was almost included, but yeah. not, not quite yet. And, I mean, they hit just about every other indigen, though, where it was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to go with ayahuasca. We're going to, we're going to go. I can't remember. Did they, did they decriminalize uh, cane toad? Uh, you know, I'm not sure about that. I'm I'd, I'd sure have to look that one, one up. I'd, I don't like doing a lot of Googling anymore while I while I talk to my guests, but I'll have to right. Google stalk that. If somebody wants to Google it and let us know here on the Facebook group, we have quite a few people joined up on the show right now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they went ayahuasca. They went mushrooms. They went right. and, and numerous species of mushrooms at that. They, oh, yeah, they, they went with San Pedro cactus. They they went with, <clears throat> excuse me, mescaline and peyote, right? Like, uh, a, f- a few forms of DMT, um, uh-huh. mm-hmm. and yeah, it was just it was incredible to see this I, I enlightening had, moment. I know that they had both the five meo and the NN DMT, yeah, listed separately, which you know a lot of people get those two confused. Well, and um, explain, let me explain the that. yeah, please, please. Okay. Well, what what happens? You have two forms of the DMT. Now you have the the DMT that's in ayahuasca. That's a very long acting form of DMT, and it's a couple of um, a couple of plants that are combined in a brew. One is a considered a, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and the other is the actual DMT. And the monoamine oxidase inhibitor just makes it bioavailable. So you have to brew these two things together. Um, but you have these two forms of short-acting DMT, which are NN-DMT, uh, nitrogen-nitrogen DMT, or um, 5-MeO, which is uh, 5-methyloxyl dimethyltryptamine. And the difference between those two is that uh, NN DMT is very visual in uh, its its effects. It's going to be more like an LSD trip. Uh, you're going to have more of a yeah yeah. It's very visual in uh, its characteristic. And then when you, you use the 5 meo DMT, it's more like just bright white light. And that's the way people describe it. It's an immediate out of body experience. And just mm. bright white light, and that's pretty much all they can comprehend. And those are the differences between those two forms of DMT. And uh, you have a lot of people that really don't know that, but being a person that sees both of them, <laughs> <laughs> I do know this. And it's but it, uh, it's very interesting though because there are, like you said, <laughs> two different forms and produced right. by different things in nature. Right. Right. And, and, you know, they do have different, the way the shamans use them, Chris, is very differently, too. Um, the Absolutely. The, the, the bright white light form of the 5-MeO, they use it in a different way than they do the very visual NN DMT. Uh, they, they guide people in different ways, but they find healing in both of these things. People are finding healing in, in using the 5-MeO and the NNDMT. So, you know, it's, it's quite fascinating to me. I've, I've and, yet uh, to meet anybody that has tried either form that has not uh-huh. been utterly changed by it. And I know, and I know, I know quite a few people that did mushrooms back in their day. And, right, you know, it right. wasn't like a life changing experience for them. Well, 
Um, and, and it is. It, it is a very, um, it's a very profound experience. Um, I, you know, that was the only word I had when I first used uh, 5MEO. That was the first one I used. I've used 10 and since then. But I used 5MEO first. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to text back to the United States, you know, what the experience was like. And the only word I could think of was, this is so profound. Yeah. And I capitalized it. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, and that was in Mexico in about maybe 20, 2013 uh, that I first used. But it was. It was it was profound. And um, all of the experiences I've had with any of the psychedelics have been profound. I've used them all. Um, the major ones anyway, the ayahuasca, the abogaine, the DMT. Um, but they're all profound and they're all very healing and they've all brought me nothing but benefit. You know, psychologically, uh, I, I was depressed for years. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to get out of it. I took an antidepressant, mm. you know, that wasn't doing me any good at all. Um, but when I went down and used the ibogaine, um, I was freed. You know, it, it it just took one session, and and the depression was over. And I haven't been depressed again since then. Wow. You know, not like I was. You know, sure I have the blues once in a while, like everybody does. But this was, you know, deep deep depression. This was PTSD, and I found relief with Abigail. Well, and one of the last topics we actually had you on about was the the nasal ketamine spray that was approved by the right, FDA right, for people right. who had gone into such a state of debilitating depression that all other methods had failed. Um, and this is right. yet another instance where, once again, uh, you hear ketamine, you think Special K, uh-huh. you know, mm-hmm. um, just, yeah. uh, just like you hear ecstasy or you hear MDMA, you think ecstasy. You start yeah. thinking about right. pills with brown spots and bad things happening at right. clubs and right. raves. Um, right. The stories start taking over instead of the scientific fact. And yes, yeah. ketamine and, and, is a, a strong dis- dissociative, which means and, that and like... It, it, it it dulls yeah. everything, but you're still kind of there. And, and and we we spoke of in the last show uh, that we did about the ketamine that you know this is one of the biggest advances. Yeah. In uh, in, in depression in, in therapy, medicine. In Absolutely. Years. Absolutely. And, and that still holds to be true, and it, it will be true for for years. Yeah, I mean, just you know, the fact just, that they came up with something. Uh, that once again was a substance that because of things happening, because of Special K, people going out and getting that and mixing it right. with other stuff back in the 90s, right. it got a horrible name. I mean, people would go out and, uh-huh. if you remember, folks, people were going out and robbing veterinary clinics around the country. Um, right. It right. was it was like back in the meth cooking days, you know, where people right, were just sure. going out and buying trucker pills by the case. Crazy um, <laughs> It yeah. was the Wild West, and it was before sure. uh, it got, uh, ketamine got wrapped up with uh, with um, hydrocodone. It got wrapped up with uh, right. with ephedrine and pseudoephedra, where it got uh-huh. classified up there with everything else and became yeah. locked yeah. down by the DEA and FDA um, yeah. and, and verboten. So... Uh, the, thus, once again, any and there was some great stuff going on with ketamine before that happened, which is where this yeah, study kind of first started. And it's taken this long to kind of break it out of um yeah twenty years and twenty years you will yeah yeah and it's a shame but but we are breaking it out the decriminalization of all these things yeah um, one's going to overlap into the other into the other into the other. And I would say in the next five years, we're going to see decriminalization go across the country. And when I see it go federal, uh, which is what I'm hoping, yeah, uh, then we're really going to have, you know, our foot in the door. Well, and that's what we need. Exactly. One last time, real quick. Uh, as we you know, will continue the conversation, everybody uh, in the Hudson Valley area listening on WMLD. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, feel free to check out dudesandbeer.com. This episode is going out live there. 
uh, right now, but you are, of course, in simulcast replay, so uh, feel free to stop on by the website, and you can check out the full episode. Before we let them go, Byron, let them know where they can go to find out more about you and the services of Beginning oh. Zybogaine Clinic. Sure. Um, well, it's Beginning Zybogaine, and the website is beginningzybogaine.com. Um, we have a, a clinic in Rosarito, Mexico. Uh, you're welcome to call uh, my personal cell number at 903 707 Uh We also have a 1 800 number on the, off, on the website. Can't think it offhand exactly what, what number that is, but it's on the website, beginningsavagain.com. But um, that's, that's where we'll treat you with Avagain. If you're opiate or opioid dependent, or even dependent on something like methamphetamine or even alcohol, we're using it for all types of um, uh, substance abuse. But that's pretty much it. Fantastic. And if you do want to get a hold of Beginning Zyba Game, folks, that number is 1 800 649 2399. Once again, 1-800-649-2399, beginningzybogain.com is where you can go to get your online application for treatment and begin the conversation with your consultant today uh, and even talk to Byron, as he said, with his phone number. While you are online checking out beginningzybogain.com, make sure to stop on by the Dudes and Beer podcast, dudesandbeer.com is the website hcuniversalnetwork.com is the motherland website of our parent network hc universal all kinds of great shows make sure and stop on by there keep on tuning in to wmld the voice of the hudson valley uh thank you so much everybody make sure to Check out audibletrial.com forward slash dudes and beer to get your 30 free days today for the holidays. Uh, make sure to tell your friends and family 30 free days of Audible at audibletrial.com forward slash dudes and beer. And now that that shameless part is over, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's continue the conversation because here recently was was a landmark moment in legislation in the United States regarding things like this. The Marijuana Funding Act finally went through. Um, and a, like, a, like this was not on a lot of people's radar. It wasn't really something that a lot of people were like nail-biting around the country. But there were a lot of people that were. Um and the reason why this weighs in, folks, is because a lot of states, you see, have legalized full on recreational and everything. But the issue is, once again, federally illegal. So they cannot purchase any product from another state. They have to provide all of it in house and in state. And that's for medical and recreational use. They can't even have it shipped um from another state where it is legal. So, enter the Marijuana Funding Act. What this does, and, and that also makes it to where if you wanted to start up a business, like, I want to start up a medical grow factory to be able to help out people and to be able to provide affordable medical marijuana to people going through chemo. Um, well, you couldn't even get a grant for that federally um, to begin with. Uh, and you definitely couldn't go get a FICA loan because the product that you're in trying to sell is federally illegal. Uh, so the the legalization of hemp that just went through nationally played a big part in that because, of course, you can't legally trade hemp over state lines when it's still a regulated thing. So uh, the Marijuana Funding Act really is going to lay a lot of groundwork for the decriminalization of a lot of these things that we are starting to see on the news, everything else, and in in this whole realm um, of everything. Because at, at this point, like I said, once it's decriminalized, uh, the learning institution can grow it. They can research it. They can start grants on researching it. 
uh, and, and you couldn't do that before. You couldn't have a grant for somebody to study the effects of psilocybin on depression, but now you can. And and that changes the face of all of it. That changes the face of medical research in involved with these substances and compounds. It changes the public face of how these compounds are viewed by people. Um, and yes, yes, there will always be abusers, Byron. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's always the first thing I hear from people is, "Are right, you? Know, here's your, your next thing you know, everybody's smoking reefer while they're driving." Right. I'm like, right. "Yeah, you know, because back in the day, everybody just drove around with a tall boy." You know? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. no. Some people drove around with a tall boy. Yeah. Guess what? Those people probably are still driving around with a tall boy. You passing the law, it didn't, just, so. it didn't stop them from driving right. around with the tall boy. Right. They just poured it into a 7-Eleven cup. Um, right. <laughs> you well, know? Well, you know, it, it's just silly. It's silly. Like the propaganda that came out yeah. years ago, and, and it's still around, and, and it's vilified everything. But uh, that's not the truth. The truth is the truth. And yeah. the truth is, is is that these people that are seeking these medicines now, uh, including marijuana, are mainly seeking them for relief yeah. of, um, you know, some type of a mental health problem going on or some type of healing. That's what people are seeking these medicines for. Nobody goes out and does ayahuasca for sure. Yeah, it's it's not enough. Yeah, it's, it's just not that kind of a, a substance. You know, it's 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 frankly like going into hell for some people. You know, they're going to encounter their own personal demons. People don't do that for fun. You know, <laughs> so it's it's ludicrous. Some of this is just ludicrous to me. And the people that are using marijuana, well, you you and I both know that marijuana is pretty inane. Um, it, it's not it's not as nearly as, as um, problematic as alcohol is, you no. know, when you're when you're out and about, you know, yeah. alcohol is a much more damaging drug, if you will, and it is a drug. Oh, but sure, it, it's much more. It's it's much more uh, of a problem than than marijuana will ever be. So I don't know. It's it's, it's just frankly ridiculous. Some of this, yeah. But you know, it's good that there's awareness coming into it now. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm always very very specific whenever I use that that uh, that four letter word drug. Uh, right. Very specific right. whenever I talk to people about that word because endogens are not a drug, folks. No, they're not. Um, they're even not at all. even ayahuasca, not a drug uh, no. because it has not gone through a chemical process. All you're doing is boiling oh. something. That's it. Uh, you're no, making a little it's, bit. Of, it's, an, it's an entheogen. It comes from the earth. Yeah. It's um, you know it's 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 natural substance. And, and and you know it's it's only typically ever been used in the, in the past for healing. Yeah. That's all anyone has ever used it for. Yeah. Drugs Never go through it. specifically a chemical process to be made. They do. Um, they do. You're taking a biological. A perfect example: cocaine, a drug. Oh yeah. Coca medicinal plant used by right, indigenous right. people without addiction for years and years and years hey right, even right. chewed by our vice president on his trip to peru into the himalayas because you know what oh, that's yeah, the only yeah. way you're gonna right. breathe in the andes folks um right. up right. above a certain height uh to go to places right. like machu picchu and stuff like that so and, and many people find the tea very therapeutic yeah, absolutely. Now, and it was, of course, yes, a base of Coca-Cola. That's where the coca came from. And no, they didn't right. put cocaine in it. What it was was yeah. an extract of coca. They basically boiled the coca, made a tea, and put it in there. It was a tonic. Right. It was a totally different right. effect than cocaine. Uh, you weren't getting exactly. strung out. You weren't like di like cooking down your your soda pop and then shooting it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Right, right, right. So, uh, it, it, totally different things. But, but the prime example is once again, somebody has to take that natural plant, put it through a chemical process 
in order to get an end result that is cocaine, sure. which, yeah, was yeah. originally made for medicinal purposes. I mean, you want an actual interesting read, folks, that's very Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, but in real life, go read The Cocaine Diaries oh. <laughs> by, wow. by Sigmund Freud. Oh, no. He was actively a regular, everyday user of cocaine, used it as a little pick-me-up, but diaried himself like as a, as a psychiatrist would. Much like I've told wow. you, Byron, that if, whenever I come do my flood dose at Beginning Zybogaine, I want to record it. I, yeah, I, absolutely. I want to listen to myself on my clear day. Like well, and, when, and when and I'm clearing everything and I'm done, it's like, okay, let's hear what my body and my mind actively released that's in those moments. Given, Chris. We'll, we will do that for you. It would, we will absolutely uh, do that for you. You know, and to, to use substances in that way um, are the proper, respectful, the reverent way to do it. Um, to right. go To go out. And and I'm not going to say that I didn't do it, folks. I did it. I did it. I also don't. Yeah. I also don't advocate anybody younger than 21 smoking marijuana. I just don't. I just don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are judgment either. centers in your brain that are not developed yet, and that's just no, psychologically right no. Um, right and when you're going to do something that could inhibit that to begin with, you can lead to more impulsive behavior. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's going to damage your brain. Um, I'm just going to say it will inhibit your already inhibited (laughs) decision-making. And and I'll throw in there that that males are the the last to develop that part. Oh, we're the most (laughs) impulsive ones of the bunch, man. We're the ones looking for the bridge to go jump off of. All right? Right, right, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) We know who we are, don't we? I I see at least one guy in the comment section over here who joined up that he knows who he is. I know he's jumped off a bridge or two. Um, (laughs) But and and that's just it, though. Um, That's what we have to be careful of whenever we're whenever we are going psychonaut. Whenever we're going into these realms. Whenever we are properly exploring this stuff you need to have have somebody there with you you've got to yeah i mean to to go into things unprepared uh psychologically unprepared emotionally spiritually unprepared um there's a reason why an ayahuasca will have you do like a good three day sometimes week long detoxification cleanse and and fasting you know not uncommon at all not in common at all. A good Iowa scarab will absolutely do that. Yeah. He'll he'll pay attention to your body and how your body's flowing with the medicine. And and of course he never uses the term drug, he's using the term medicine. Yeah. That's all they ever refer to it as is medicine. And uh they will absolutely work with you on that. But uh, you know, so so with the Ibogaine too. You know, we look at that as medicine. It is medicine. Well, it's and nothing else. And even when you ask them where where this knowledge came from, uh, mm-hmm. they say the plants told them. The plants told them. Yes, it comes from the plants. The plants are, and that's why we call them master plants, um, because they just they have a no, knowledge that goes back for thousands of years. And each time you know we use these medicines, we gain the insight that the plants give us. So we call them master plants, you know, and, and, and they're just like, um, well, they're a tool. And I, I think that now that um, hopefully society is going to be looking at these, these plants as more of a tool than a drug, mm. and, and that's going to be a good thing. And that's what I hope for. Well, and just just a little while ago, we were when when we started talking about ayahuasca DMT things like that we were talking about how there is there's actively a cannabinoid system in our body and it's it's right. not necessarily right. this way for a lot of things like psilocybin uh um i want to say mescaline is in the DMT family though correct well it's it's a, it's it's yeah loosely it's a, it's like a derivative compound yeah, it really is. Yeah. It really is. 
Uh, yeah, but uh, DMT specifically is one of those compounds that, much like cannabinoids, THC, um, our bodies well, actively yeah. have receptors for. Our well, body secretes our bodies DMT. DMT. Yeah. Um, the monks that, that used to meditate for hours produced small amounts of DMT. That's what um, we have a pineal gland. Um, if it's not calcified in most people, um, mm. but we have a pineal gland and that pineal gland, um, supposedly operates, uh, in a, in a system of DMT. So our body does produce small amounts of DMT, just like many plants and animals do. Now, now you, you just brought up something that I've heard numerous times I am aware uh-huh. of are audience may not be aware of byron I, explain the calcification of a pineal gland oh, number sure. one let's let's delve just a little bit because in order to understand psychoactive substances and what it is uh-huh. that byron Burkhammer does folks you got to kind of understand the the psycho in there the the brain sure, the sure. mind the, well, the the understanding and to understand yeah. what the pineal gland does to begin uh-huh. with and then sure. what the difference is well, between a healthy and a calcified pineal okay. gland. Well, well, let me explain what, what a pineal gland is. Uh, the pineal gland is basically, uh, it's been referred to over time as the third eye. And, and what it really is, it is an organ in the, in the brain. Um, it's um, an organ that's almost exactly like an eye. It has rods and cones in it. Just like an eyeball does. Really? Uh, yes, it does. It does. But it can only see in the dark because it's it's, encl- mm. it's enclosed in the brain. But it is a uh, it is it is um, an organ that's just pretty much almost like a the human eye. It's got rods and cones in it. And what happens is um, back in say World War Two. Uh, the Nazis actually started using um, fluoride uh, to basically uh, keep prisoners calm. They thought that when they added fluoride to water that it would keep the prisoners calm and that their concentration camps wouldn't get out of control and that sort of thing. And somehow this just kind of systematically spilled over Mm. into the United States because we have a well, that's a different story, but we have a a, a third, a, a fourth right going on here. But somehow we have started adding fluoride to our water uh, with a misconception that it would heal our teeth, cavities, things like that, which is just totally untrue. Yeah. Uh, fluoride does not need to be added to water. In fact, when it's added to water, they have to use chemically protective gear. Yeah, uh, like a hazmat suit, to add it to the water because it's considered a poison. Yeah. So they're adding this poisonous fluoride to water, and what this does is it basically calcifies the pineal gland. Now, what mystics have believed for thousands of years is that the pineal gland is basically our gateway to a multidimensional reality, if you will. Mm. And uh, it's it's our it's our gateway to access spiritual state. It's our access to, to you know uh, gain these states that these uh, these potent psychedelic medicines can get. So when the psychedelic medicines are given to us, essentially they're operating within the field of the pineal gland, and they're accessing the pineal gland and causing the experience. And and that's what that's. That's the beauty of um, decalcified pineal gland. There's ways to do it. Uh, if you've, you know, fluoridated water for years, there are ways to um, defluoridate and decalcify the pineal gland. Mm. Uh, there's different techniques uh, on YouTube, that sort of thing. You can Google it and, and find out. But uh, that's basically what it is, Chris, is... is um, yeah. It's the third eye. It's our it's our spiritual gateway, if you want to call it. 
Well, and it's interesting because the pineal gland lies for most folks right right underneath where your soft spot is as a kid. Uh, your pineal yeah, gland uh, is uh, the lack of light to your pineal gland is what causes a sad season effect seasonal affective disorder, uh, yeah, which yeah. I actively suffered from whenever I was in Maine. Uh, where you just really? get really down. Well, I mean, once it, like come this time of year in Maine, it's pretty much gray three quarters of the time until springtime. Um, so you you don't get a whole lot of sunlight because uh, there's cloud cover all the time. Uh, you see a wow. lot in people up near Alaska, things like that, um, and far polar regions, that kind of stuff, where you're just deprived of daylight. Your, your brain does not get the vitamin D uh, that it's supposed to get. Right. And it's, it's a regular occurrence for all of us because we live such a sedentary lifestyle now. We aren't out fishing. We aren't out gardening. We aren't out farming, doing those kind of things. We're locked inside podcasting, man. Um, <laughs> right, right. You know, like... I, that's 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 the world that we live in, and we wonder why the mania that we live under exists. You know, um, it's because yeah, we aren't getting that exercise, we aren't getting that daylight into our brain that we're supposed to be getting, that we're naturally supposed to have and crave. So, yeah, it's 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 interesting uh, just to even even rabbit hole on the topic of the pineal gland right there, because it's it's really something that people do not realize a lot about. Uh, they do not understand what that gland does in their body and what they can do to exercise it. Literally, I, I just told you, folks, the best thing you can do is remove your hat. And go outside and get an hour of sunlight a day. You know, try to get at least 30 minutes of sunlight on the top of your head a day if you can. Um, you'll notice rapidly that uh, you start feeling a little bit happier after a week or so of doing it. Um, it's, it's great. A lot of people use daylight bulbs uh, just to kind of simulate that action inside. There are companies that have completely switched to daylight bulbs uh, because of this research and understanding of how light affects the pineal gland. Um, and it's, it's amazing the things that our brains do and what these chemicals and compounds found in nature can help us discover about them. And... So, Byron, thank you yeah. so much for taking the time once again to come on the show, as you always do, uh, to share this vast realm of knowledge about hallucinogens, hallucinogenic research, uh, the world of Ibogaine and, and the, the wonderful healing manifestations that it has uh, CBD, everything. Uh, we're, we're soon hopefully going to be getting a CBD manufacturer, um, who, who is coming on to talk the science of manufacturing and what you need to look for great. whenever you're getting CBD oils. Cause it's, it's the new snake oil folks. Um, it's come out here recently that, uh, vitamin E is apparently what has been causing the popcorn lung in people. Yeah. Um, and, and once again, like I said, on the Dudes and Beer group, commenting to our good friend and former guest Andy McDearman, uh, he posted an article talking about that, and I was like, yes, and most of those were coming from non-label brands. So uh -huh. make sure to buy something that's barcoded. Make sure to buy something that has a state-approved stamp on it. Yeah. Don't yeah. buy from people off the street. Don't buy from your friends. Buy directly from a distributor. Buy directly from, you know, uh, when go to a state, get one. Um, right. What have you? Uh, it's 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 
it's too dangerous to not do it. There are too many knockoffs. Years ago, people started with the with the Kush and stuff like that, using different chemicals, and that's basically the same thing. They're using the same chemicals uh, along with vitamin E, which simulates the thickness of the CO two extracted CBD oil. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, they're using these research chemicals and stuff like that in conjunction with that to make a synthesized marijuana product. And it's just, it's horrifying. Wow. It's horrifying. And there will always be people doing that. There will always be people like the the toad shamans that we talked about in our last yeah. visit, Byron, uh, where they're just somebody that went out and bought a toad, man, and they learned how to dry the poison, you know? They don't know the dosage. They don't like. Good Lord, I I can't think of a shaman in his right mind that would probably give you standard ayahuasca and toad poison at the same dosage, at the same time. They 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 pride themselves in knowing you know a proper dose. Well, I I hear about it all the time though, where people are like, yeah, you know, we did both of them at the same time, and I'm like, no, no. I don't know of well, an ayahuasca shaman that would and, do that. And that's the same way with Ibogaine. Ibogaine is so inherently dangerous. Yeah. You know, if it's used in the hands of the inexperienced, that, you know, I'm going to have a physician administering the, yeah. you know, Ibogaine in the clinic. Yeah, exactly. Cool it's, under, it's under a controlled circumstance. It's under observation. Right. You're observed the right. whole time. Um, They're on a heart monitor. Yeah. Precisely. So there, there's a difference when you're going to somewhere like Beginnings Ibogaine and and when you've joined like an Ibogaine group on Reddit and go into somebody's backyard in Wisconsin right. for a weekend, you know. But it's, it, it is out there and it's, it's good it to is. know that it is out there and, and that, you know, you need to be properly trained. I'm, you need to have proper supervision. I am. You should never do this alone. Exactly. Exactly. I am all about awareness of these indigens, these fantastic substances provided by the earth. But you've got to be respectful of them, just like the earth, just like the critters walking around the earth. They're beautiful, but pick up the wrong one and it'll kill you. Um, Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Same rule applies to the plants standing still, folks. Um, right, right. Pick up the wrong one or use the wrong amount of the wrong one, and it will kill you. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, well, Chris, I've, I've enjoyed uh, having this discussion with you tonight. And, always. Uh, and uh, you know, you 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 lend a lot to um, you know a good a good discussion, a Thank good you. interview. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you always coming on, sharing your vast realm of knowledge in this area, and helping educate our audience on the difference between indigens and drugs and why these things are being decriminalized. It's not just because of a party culture, folks. It's because real right. research can be done. If we decriminalize well, them, this, re- this, real people can is, get help. This is the real work, Chris. What you and I are doing tonight, yeah. this is the real work. Thank you. This is the real work to, to advance this science, to advance this medicine the, it and, starts and with conversation. It. it does. It does. Absolutely. It starts with two scientists sitting around a tuna sandwich going, why can't we do this? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know. And I sure have enjoyed it. And it's same sure here. It. I love having you on every time. We need to make it more regular. Uh, it's been way well, too sure, long. Anytime. So you just let me know. You bet. You and let me know. anytime you got a topic you want to talk about, you feel free to give a shout uh before we let you go one last time, let everybody know where they can go to get a hold of you and beginnings Ibogaine to get their Ibogaine treatment to start sure. their path to healing and well being today. Sure. Okay. It's uh, the the link uh to the website is beginnings ibogaine uh dot com. And uh my personal cell number is nine zero three seven zero seven zero two five eight. And the one eight hundred number is one eight hundred six. Was it six three nine seven? What was it again, Chris? Hold on, give me one second. Um, uh, it's coming up right off. now. That number 
folks, for Beginnings I Began is 1 800 649 2399. 2399. 649 2399. That is com to go and apply for your treatment today. Byron, please do hold the line while we close things out. Once again, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your passion for this topic and your passion for healing and understanding about these compounds and substances while you are online checking out all the great work of byron burkhammer and the folks at beginning i began please do stop on by the dudes and beer podcast that's where you can find all the episodes in their entirety everything people um we haven't locked anything down yet so yet is the prime word um anyway Stop on by. That's where you can get all the episodes. That's where you can find the Knowledge Vault if you want to find out more about declassified programs that the government does while you sleep, laws that are passed, what your rights are, all kinds of things. You want a copy of the Constitution? It's in there. Uh, Stop on by dudesandbeer.com forward slash knowledge to check that out. Stop on by hcuniversalnetwork.com to check out us, all the other great shows. Uh, until next time, everybody, check out audibletrial.com forward slash dudes and beer. Get your 30 free days. Till next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and remember if you can't be good, be good at it. We'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. To listen to our audio streams or chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.